tonight. Um, I won't take this off. Mm -hmm. It will be understanding better. Um, I'm Lisa. I'm uh, the manager for the Waitaki Whitestone Geopark. And as part of our engagement and education program, we've been organising a range of public talks. Um, probably over the last two and a half years, but we've always just done them in Omaru. So this year we thought, why not go around the district and choose topics that are very um, particular to the communities. So today we are in Omarawa, which is awesome. Um, our talk tonight um, will be held by David Barrow. And um, David is a geologist um, from GNS Science, um, visiting us in his base in Dunedin. Um, you will have seen the promotional flyer about the topic tonight, the Oslo Fault. Um, now we're all very familiar with earthquakes in New Zealand um, because it's a very tectonically active country. And with mountain building processes continuing today, creating our impressive landscapes that we see. Um, the evening, um, we are going to learn more about the Oslo Fault. Um, and at, I guess we just want to make clear that this is more of an educational talk rather than a hazards talk on what to do when there's an earthquake. <coughs> Um, so I think we're going to learn a lot about um, our landscapes today and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we will be recording this talk um, as we do with most of our talks and um, it will be later on our YouTube channel as well, just so you know. Um, just hold your questions and your excitement till the end. We will have about 10-15 minutes towards the end where David will take some questions as well. Um, yeah, but I will hand over to you. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, um, great pleasure to be here to uh, talk to you tonight. And it's nice to see uh, such a good turnout on a, uh, a rather wet, rather wet evening. Um, so I'm going to talk. I, I, I'm, I'm going to um, tell you a bit about the Oslo Fault, which is uh, one of the most active fault lines in this part of the country. That means that it. Uh, has a recurrent of movement more frequently than many other faults um, have. And seeing as it's a talk about faults, I'm going to tell you about glaciers first. And there's a very good reason for that, because um, glaciers um, have contributed to the imprint of the landforms through, through um, past ice ages, um, spreading deposits and creating deposits and landforms in the basins through here and they provide a reference surface for seeing the fault. So it's the, it's the landforms of glaciers which um, really help us to understand and, and the location and, and nature of the fault. So this is um, a glacier. Uh, this is the Murchison Glacier. It's New Zealand's fourth largest glacier. Almost no one's ever heard of it. It's up in the uh, northern part of uh, our Rocky Mount Cook uh, National Park. So glaciers form where the um, up where the precipitation is great and the mountains are high. Um, this map here illustrates an interpretation of um, the extent of ice at the peak of the last ice age. So uh, the, um, in the grey here is where we interpret the glaciers to have been about 20,000 years ago, um, covering virtually the whole axis of the Southern Alps with um, tongues of ice coming out down through the valleys and, and these ones down here, it's uh, Takapo, Takaki and Ohau. Um, and for comparison, the white is the modern glaciers. So uh, compare the white to the grey and that's the difference between ice age climate and, and, and modern climate. And so this was the situation as recently as 20,000 years ago. Uh, so, <coughs> This is the Tasman Glacier, well, 30 years ago now. Um, so you can see the, the glacier flows from, uh, from its catchment up the back here. Um, it's all covered in a, in, a, in a thin veneer of rock as the ice melts. So the ice, is a, the snow accumulates up here, forms the ice, the ice flows down. And at the margins of the glacier, you'll see these ridges around here. We call that moraine, and that's just the debris that <coughs> sort of piles up at the edge of the glacier tongue that melts. And, and here, of course, Tasman Lake was just starting to form um, at that time, and of course, and now, today, it's back to about there. 
The other thing which is going to be particularly of interest to us here is the, uh, you, you'll, you'll see the, there's the modern Tasman River coming out of uh, the developing lake, but you can see all the braided channeling patterns there. That's the, the <coughs> where the river used to flow out from the front of the glacier when the glacier was out of its moraine. And that was as recently as the late 1800s. And the, <coughs> the glacier was uh, filling this basin and, and meltwater was flowing out down the plains here, creating this distinctive uh, braided river pattern. So that's a modern glacier. This is an old one. So this is the um, uh, <coughs> Lake Ohau, uh, that's the, uh, the weir, and this is the uh, canal going out down into the Upper Waitaki Power System. The lake is where the glacier was. This ridge of stuff around here is the moraines, and you can see the braided, uh, mm -hmm. the braided river channels out the front of it. So it's very much like the Tasman Glacier one, it's just that this one's 18,000 years old. And all those features are still preserved in the landscape. You can see out behind here, this, this also is moraine topography of hummocky, lumpy through here. So the glacier at, at an earlier time was right out to here. And you can see the old river, river plains that used to issue from the ice and form those fossil river plains down there. This one here is 22,500 years old. So through here, we've got a, a completely fossilized landscape that's of considerable age. And that is one of the, that, that's one of the features which makes the Mackenzie so, Mackenzie Basin um, so spectacular. And it's why the Osler Fault is so well expressed because it goes through old landfalls. Uh, just for comparison, this is the, side, the eastern side of Lake Pirikaki, and you can, the lake is where the glacier was, and, and these belts of, of uh, um, <coughs> moraine through here, each one marks the margin of the margin of the glacier at a time in the past, and you can see uh, river, uh, meltwater, meltwater streams broke through the moraine through here, and you can see the braided river pattern. It's, it's an example of a a completely fossilised landscape, and virtually nothing has changed in the <coughs> 18,000 years to 20,000 years to 65,000 years out here. It's all just, it's all... So the, the, the ridges that run this way are, are gradual, sorry, we're supposed to wait till the end. Yep. So each one of those marks the position when the glacier was yep. here. Yep. Um, so there's hundreds of them, so it, it's, it's a fantastic record. Um, to record all of that, a common way for doing that is making what we call a geomorphological map, which emphasises the landform. So this is uh, Lake Pukaki, Ohau, and in the, the oranges are the youngest moraines. They're about 18,000 years and they're around both lakes. Um, older belt that's 20 to 30,000 years in the red. And Older ones, about 65,000 years, are in the green. And the different colours of brown out here are the old river plains. So <coughs> each one of these brown areas through here is um, um, a fossil river plain that issued from the glaciers when they were filling the basins. And in the red through here, you can see a red line which does a right angle turn and then snakes its way all the way through up into here, is the Ostler Fault. Uh, so we're going to, um, that's, that's going to be the feature, and we'll, we'll have a tour and a look at all of these features. So the landform map helps to give us a context for understanding, recognising where the fault is, and understanding its movements. Now, uh, this is, so this is Lake Ohau, um, and... <coughs> A technique's been developed in the last 15 years which allows us to date, to actually get ages for these landforms. It involves, I won't go into detail, but it involves um, boulders left by the glacier on top of the moraine landforms and um, it turns out that they're affected by cosmic radiation that comes in through the atmosphere. 
that causes small, that, that, that radiation over time causes tiny changes in the chemistry of the rock surface. Um, the effect of that is, is to cause a build-up of a, of a um, molecule called beryllium-10. And so the longer the boulders sat out under the sky, the more beryllium-10 it has. Take a sample, measure the beryllium-10, work out the age to pretty good precision. And so uh, this was a PhD study from a colleague of mine in the United States back, as we did this back in the late two uh, <coughs> late 2000s. Every one of these um, little boxes here gives the age of a sample on a moraine and, and it's in thousands of years. So 22,300 plus or minus 600 is the age as he got for that particular boulder. And so <clears throat> when you put it all together, he's shown this belt of moraine within which, which, which encloses the, the lake where the, where the glacier was is about 18,000 years old. And this light brown coloured um, area here is the river plain which issued from there. So that's an 18,000 year old river plain. These ones, this belt of moraine through here is 22,500 years old. And so this river plain is also 22,500 years old because it was formed when the glacier was here and the meltwater was flowing that way. And you can see <coughs> that the red lines here, the Oster Fault, go right across those landforms and so through here we get a 22 and a half thousand year long perspective on the, what the fault movements have been. So <clears throat> that's all very good, we we'll sort of, sort of de deal with the nuts and bolts of, um, of the sort of the glacier and landform background and, and talk about and, and, and the geomorphology and now we're now, go, we're, we're now going to have a, a tiki tour from the south here down near Amarama. So that's uh, Amarama's here, uh, Twizel is there. Um, so we, we're, we're going to do a, uh, a tour north along the fault and uh, <coughs> just have a look at its character. Uh, yep, so this is, this is the first area, um, Ahariri River, in this, uh, in, in this, in this yellow colour to the Ahariri Riverbed. Um, browns are about an 18,000 year old um, Ice Age uh, river plain. This is a place called the Knot, incidentally, amongst us, us geologists, because the, 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 the faults come along and it turned a right angle corner, and so uh, it's long been known as the Knot. So, this is what it looks like. So, the, <coughs> you'll have your eye in now for these fossil river plains, mm -hmm. the beautiful, beautiful braided channeling, which you can <coughs> see particularly from the air. There's the modern Ahariri River, which is cut into that plain. And you'll see this line coming through here, snaking through there, coming around the corner and heading off somewhere mm -hmm. in that direction. That's the Ostler Fault. And this step has has been produced by several earthquake ruptures over the last 18,000 years or so. Um, it's higher on this part of the plain here because that's older and as the river is cut down to lower levels, the fault offset of the lower terraces is smaller because they've had the, the younger landforms have had fewer earthquakes and so the amount of offset is less. Here's another view of the same thing looking back towards the north and you can start to see the, um, that's the highway going through here, so, so, so 10 kilometres north from, or towards the Linders Pass from Murray, you go over a bit of a step and that's the fault. Um, and you can see it, it's, it's fantastic, it's sort of come around here, it's bent around, it's broken out in a couple of places, turned another corner, bent around, so it, it, it's got a very funky, a very funky form about it. Now this is a very similar <coughs> view, but looking further north, uh, Lake Ohau, Pukaki, and Clay Cliffs is in here, and a range of, there's, there's a range of low hills um, heading through here, and they're there because the fault line out here has lifted them up over time. So this, this line of hills from Clay Cliffs through Table Hill and, and, and northwards is there because of the fault. And there, 
<coughs> I would say, at, at, at a rough guess, that um, the height of these hills here is probably about half a million years of uplift along the fault. Earthquake by earthquake, it's tracked up. Erosion has dissected them. And um, I think I have a have a diagram. So this is, this is the same photo with some annotation. You've got your 18,000 year old river plain, the fault in the red line coming through here, branches and there's a branch of it out here, it makes its way north past Twizel and then heads up into the Ben Ohau range um, in the Twizel River headwaters. I know, I know I'm not allowed to ask questions, but the knot, where is that in relation to there? Just in there. Where it been? Oh, yeah, 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 by, yeah, by, uh, it's the little road there that goes over. Shortcut, shortcut road, road. Yeah, yeah, goes over it there. <coughs> this, uh, these diagrams are actually um, on the information panel at Clay Cliffs. So right. these are actually mm -hmm. listed actually where, they, where they're from. Because I made them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so that same view here, we're going to have a little look at the geology under that next diagram. So this is the, there's your photo, and this is like a block diagram that's a sort of a square, sort of cut a chunk out of the earth, lifted up, and this, and this is what you'd expect to see if you dug down. So the fault has broken through to the surface along the red dashed line through here. Um, you don't see it through here because the Ahariri River has been across there more recently than the most <coughs> than the last fault movement. And so the, the fault's clear, prominent here, but we don't see it there because the land surface is too young. Um, and beneath the ground we have layers of clay stones and, and gravel stones or conglomerate um, and the fault dipping down at, at depth under there. So that, that sort of gives a picture of the um, what things to expect uh, in the subsurface. So we're going to move north a little bit here. So we were just down here. Um, the fault is, um, comes along and it breaks into several branches and starts up again out here and then runs along through here. The Lake Ohau Road is right about there which comes in and the highway is about there. So the highway drives alongside all of this and then it diverts off to Lake Ruatanifa, uh, Lake Ohau <coughs> Road there. And <coughs> it's pretty spectacular, pretty spectacular. <coughs> so uh, Lake Pukaki, uh, Ruatanifa uh, is the highway. Uh, Lake Ohau Road heads up and over the fault there and up, uh, up uh, this is where you had the washout the other, the other day at the bridge there. Um, and you'll see, so this river, so, so this, these plains here, that's the 22,500 year old river plain from the Ohau Glacier. Um, and you can see the fault is at the foot of the hill here, it's come around, it's broken out, it's wrinkled up the ground, so it's broken through wrinkled and bent things, stepped over out here, stepped back in there, runs along the foot of the hill there. And we'll, we'll look more at the continuation of it in a minute. Um, this uh, landform here is moraine. You can see that there's little ridges through there. So the, 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 the glacier was out this far at some point, the Ohau Glacier, and, and the rest of this is uh, old river plain. It's uplifted about 200 metres relative to, to this side down here. Uh, this, is, this is called Table Hill. And we do have some dating that suggests this is about 130,000 years old. That landform, 200 metres of offset, 130,000 years. About the same as we have here. This is as much as 20 metres high on 15 to 20 metres. <coughs> sorry, 20 metres high on a 22 and a half thousand year old landform. Um, just a bit more of a close up. You can see. Um, uh, the distinctive thing is you can see the old river channels coming down mm. through this gap through here and they go right over where the fault is and they're continuing the same grain out there and the fault's gone right across the line of them. So that's one of the diagnostic things of a, of, of a fault such as this is that um, it's clearly cut across the things that rivers formed and so 
this step through here can't be, can't be a river. No. So a river, <coughs> a river didn't make that, and that's one of the, the real beauties of um, the record that we have in the landforms of Mackenzie country, as we can see this so clearly expressed for what it is. Um, you know, there is, there is no better example anywhere <coughs> that you would find in the world. You find some just as good, but, but, but better ones, I think you'd be pretty hard pressed. Um, just to compare, it's, it's, it's fantastic seeing it from above, but I'm I also have some shots from the ground, just so that you um, get, them, get the idea of they can be quite difficult to spot when, when you're on the ground compared to up in the air. So this is uh, uh, from State Highway 8 at the uh, Ohau Road turn-off, mm -hmm. Ohau Road there, and so from the highway you just look towards them, the uh, Ohau range in the back here, and, and, and the land steps up. You sort of think, oh, that's a, a river or something, but no. The river plains go this way across it, and that step there is entirely the fault. It's what the fault's done in 22,500 years. Just to go back into the air, because it's so much better to see it. Um, so we were just looking uh, from the ground back back there. Uh, Lake Ohau is just out of sight through there. And you can see these, 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 these river, <coughs> old river channels, just, they go right over the fault. And so, and, so, and so the fault is broken and buckled through um, all of this beautiful architecture of these uh, fossil river plains. David, before you move on, can you explain the springs? Have they just popped up along the fault as well? Ones through here? Yeah. Yeah, so, so um, because it, <coughs> it rains, <laughs> we have noticed it rains, um, so <laughs> there is a groundwater table un un under here which um, percolates down to a certain level. It might be uh, you know, 10 or 15 metres down before you get down to the sort of the, the, the permanent saturated water table. And the, 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 the fault here is high enough that on the so if, 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 if the water table's you know, that far below the surface up in here, um, and the fault is that high, then at the fault, it's sort of, the groundwater sort of bumps into the foot of the fault. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one of the reasons that you'll have springs okay. just there. <coughs> I just can't help but putting in these beautiful photos. These, mm -hmm. these are all from our, our we call our visual media library. So the, the, these we uh, for many decades, uh, what was the New Zealand Geological Survey and is now GNS Science employed a full-time photographer to do scientific photography mm -hmm. by Lloyd Homer, and we have a fantastic library of all of his uh, all of his wonderful photos taken over over decades. And again, this is this is the Spring Creek Conservation Area. So this is just um, from the highway. This bank that you look at there, that's the fault. And it's sort of right, <coughs> right close at hand. Uh, just coming a little further north, this is Table Hill in here. Um, you're getting your eye in for all these fossil river plains mm -hmm. preserved there. Um, the fault offset here is about 200 metres into an older landform, and you can see it's got a whole set of cracks running along the edge of the bank, so it's all, all sliced up into little cracks, which are probably just gravitation, just dropping things down a bit, and there's been some quite spectacular landslides come off the, um, the uplift of ground. Um, there's the fault scar, the little line through mm -hmm. here, that's the most recent movements, and you don't see it under that landslide, which, <coughs> so that's one of the little clues, I, I look at that, but you you, but you see it again just over on that part of that landslide. So mm. the fault has moved at least once after this bit of landslide came down, mm. but not since that one came down. Mm. So you can start to get a relative chronology of the amounts of offset in the landscape from, um, from, from the way it affects the landform features. That's just a view of the uh, landslide from, from the highway just to um, just and just so that's about <coughs> that's how much offset the fault's done in about 130,000 years, maybe a bit more. We, we we can't date these things precisely, but it's um, it's uh, pretty impressive. Now just coming into um, Lake Ruatanifa and the uh, 
through Taki and the Ohau canals uh, through there. And so the, the Oslo Fault has got, it's broken into several strands by these red lines here. This, um, the main strand comes through here. Uh, there's a hill called Mount Oslo here, which from, from which the fault takes its name, after which it is named. That dies out. So there's nothing there, but another one starts over here, and that gets bigger and bigger going in that direction. Uh, this is, so we're looking back to the south here, so that's um, Ohau A power station. You can see all the, the, the fossil river plains through here. Uh, this is Table Hill, the uplifted uh, bit of ground, and there's one of the fault scarps through there, and there's another one starting up and, and continuing in that direction. You'll see that looking from the other angle. This is uh, looking towards the north, uh, Araki Mount Cook, Ben Ohau Range. Um, table Hill with all those uh, cracks along the edge of it, <coughs> and there's the fault scar going across the. This is before Lake Ruatanifu was there. So this, oh. this predates the dam. Um, so this was this was the original Ohau River Valley. Um, fault comes across here, offsets some medium level terraces, but not the not the, not not the river bed, and then continued across in that direction. That's Mount Oslo there. <coughs> Um, and that's the fault scar. This is from the uh, corner of Max Smith Drive and Frieda de Far Place. So that, that this is uh, the entrance into the rowing complex um, and, and the uh, Ruatanifa camping ground. I'm standing here on the 18,000 year old river plain, and that's the 18,000 year old river plain on the upstream side of the fault. It's been offset by 20 metres vertically. Um, and <coughs> Um, unfortunately, Mr. Hawkins grown a lot of trees, and obviously you can't see it properly, but but uh, but it, it, it's uh, it's it's certainly there and really clear in the old photos that predate the trees. Mm -hmm. um, this is um, just beside Lake Ruatanifu, and, and and this is a, a fault scarp across a a terrace which is set down into the Ohau River Valley. So it's a younger terrace as the river's cut down. It's about seven metres offset there, so only it's only had a third of the offset on this particular river terrace than we had on the fossil ice age uh, river plains. Um, just another view, and, and um, to sort of highlight how, in some place, in some places it's quite sharp and easy to see. Other places it's sort of broken up, and there's a bit, a bit of bending going on, and stepping off, and some more bending, and so. This is the fault as you see it from uh, Old Glen Lion Road, just on the west side of uh, Twizel, looking towards uh, Ben Ohau and Ben Ohau Range there. It's about 20 metres high, but it's the zone where the fault is broken out is spaced over several hundred metres, and so it's less abrupt to the eye, but it's, uh, it's all still there. And this is, so this is just up, uh, the last photo was taken uh, back down there, we're looking towards the north, this is the 22,500 year old river plain, um, that's Mount Osla, and so when you see it from the air, this also is a river plain, which was originally flowing towards the sea, because that's the, that's the custom with rivers, they, they, they need to go to the sea. Um, <laughs> The movement on the fault has tilted the whole thing backwards, and so this now slopes quite markedly inland. It was formed sloping towards the sea, but now the fault movement has just jacked it and jacked it and tilted it right up to uh, quite a bit. There's probably about 200,000 years old there, so in 200,000 years there's been a big amount of uplift and a lot of tilting, um, and it's all, all thanks very much to these fossil ice age landforms that give us this frame of reference in the, uh, in the uh, Mackenzie Basin. Um, right, this is about the same location, um, just to illustrate uh, how I would interpret the fault to be beneath the ground. So it's the fault scar that's broken through the surface, and in order to explain the areas that are tilted backwards, in some places tilted forwards. This is how I've drawn the fault going down depth. Um, the 
the scale is the same that way as that way. So we're getting down to uh, below sea level here. So it's um, 700 metres under the ground. And, and, and that's how I've interpreted the uh, angle that the fault must be at to give you the tilting <coughs> of the surface. So that's a, a sort of a geometric reconstruction. It's based on the landfall beaches up the top and again the huge benefit of these fossil ice age landforms for, for reference and of, of, of an age that we can actually date. Uh, right, so we were just down here, that's the Pukaki Canal at Pukaki, uh, the Ostler Fault, one strand dying out there, it's Mount Ostler, this comes down there, and a new one has become very prominent along the foot of the Ben Ohau range here. Um, one strand out the front, another one developing in behind. They sort of join together in here, and then they go up into the high, in, into more mountainous terrain, and we lose, we lose track of it because we've gone off those wonderful fossil landforms into much younger active mountain topography, where uh, er erosion and so forth is... Um, still modifying things. It's not a stable landscape to preserve the fault movements. Uh, yeah, so there's the, this is the one out the front, and you can see um, what's often a, a, a telltale sign, if you like, that the fault is not diving steeply down into the ground, is that its surface breakout is wobbling all over the place, so you get some breaking out here, and wobbling and going forth, which is um, a very good sign that the fault's actually inclined quite gently and each time it moves it's sort of bulldozing things and so it's sort of bulldozing its way out of the ground and it's breaking out and making a bit of a mess. If it was much steeper it would be a much cleaner break but because it's having to bulldoze its way through you get this really wonky sort of a surface expression. And there's the other strand that it's along of the hills through there, and, we, and we're starting to, uh, here you'll see these um, hummocky, this hummocky ground through here, uh, moraines from glaciers, not of the Ohau or the Pukaki Valley draining into the main divide, these actually formed locally in the Ben Ohau range and flowed down the valley, so these are <coughs> the moraines of local glaciers that came down the valley systems here. It's a very early Lloyd Homer photo, but it's in black and white and it's got good contrast. And so <coughs> we were looking down here at this these wonky expressions of the fault. And it gathered itself together and then goes into the mountains as a very sharp step. Um, I would guess it's gone the fault down here is sort of more, more gently dipping down. I'd say up in here, it's probably steepened up a whole lot. And that's why it's sort of sharp like a knife. So there's a there's the <coughs> the view of what it looks like, and I'm just going to spend um, uh, a little bit of time now just putting that into what it means in the wider world, and actually looking at the <coughs> the whole context of it at a New, Ze at, at, at a New Zealand level, and, and, and then sort of zooming in a bit. So a little bit of um, Big picture to start with. So this is um, so many of you will, will know this, but just 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 by way of summary, um, the Earth's crust is made of two basic types of rock. We have continental crust, which is light and quite thick, and that's what's in the greens and the yellows. <coughs> we have ocean crust, which is quite dense and quite thin, and that's what forms the ocean basins. And these zigzag blue lines through here are where these <coughs> blocks of crust, we call them plates, that's one plate, that's another plate, sort of like the plates on a <coughs> scales on a, on a fish. And they, um, the, blue zag, the, the blue jagged line is where they're spreading apart. And in other places, these uh, pink lines through here, the ocean crust is diving back down under the continents. Um, 
to a geologist, it's all pretty quick. Um, in reality, the movement of any of these things is about the rate of fingernail growth. But give it longer, you can grow some really long fingernails given enough time. Uh, right, so I'm just going to just stay, go back into the past. So as recently as 200 million years ago, and I'm saying that as a geologist, as recently, um, what we know now as New Zealand was here on the margin of the Gondwana supercontinent. So we were um, part of what later broke apart to become Antarctica and Australia, India and Africa. So we were all at one time joined together and then we split apart. Um, and as I say, it's as recently as 200 million years ago, so it's uh, <coughs> uh, blink of an eye to a geologist. So this is this is bathymetry, so this is the depth, depth of the sea or the height of the land. Um, and in the oranges and the uh, sort of yellows to greens, that's continental crust rock. And in the blues, where it's deep, that's the ocean basin. So we've got the Tasman <coughs> Sea, which is um, uh, floored by ocean crust, that's Australia through there. Um, and, and then we have uh, Pacific Ocean Basin, and this dark blue line through here is the uh, Tonga Trench, which is a bit place where the, where the ocean crust is diving down, and that's the, about there is the second deepest place on Earth, <coughs> just off from Tonga, about uh, 11, 11 kilometres deep. Um, and just to put, put that into a bit more context on this sort of shaded elevation model, looking from an angle, this is the um, Ocean, ocean crust beneath the Tasman Sea out here. Standing much higher is the continental crust of Zealandia. Um, and through here is the boundary between the plates. So this, this is a ridge, which and, and this plate here is moving that way. That one's moving that way. There's a bit of a ridge pushed up. And in one spot, it's got high enough to make Macquarie Island. But it's sitting on top of a, a ridge on the plate boundary, whereas Auckland Island and Campbell Island are actually just sticky up bits of our <coughs> of our continental mass. So this is the same map as we saw a minute ago, but it's coloured up by the geology rather than by the <coughs> by, by the um, elevation. Ocean floor rocks and the blues, different shades of blue for different ages. This green thing is a, a special a special type of ocean crust, it's called an oceanic plateau, and it's a bit thicker than the usual ocean floor uh, crust. And in the pinks through reds and yellows, this is the continental rocks of Zealandia. And you can see that <coughs> it doesn't take much to guess that this here and that there used to be joined together. And so in fact, in the last 20 million years, so blink of an eye, this used to be back there, and this bit by the plate movement has been warped around like so. Ocean, the ocean crust is diving under Zealandia through here, but then it stops. It's just got continent rocks both sides, and so we have fault lines through the continental rocks, and the alpine fault is one you've heard of, and that's right in there. And then off the Ordland, you go back into ocean, ocean floor crust and continental crust, and that's diving back under us again. So that's what these things, this, this, this is a diagram to illustrate the thin ocean crust, the continent crust, and where the two butt together, almost always the ocean crust will go down into the continent because of lower lying and it's a bit more dense. Uh, another angle of the same thing, and people look at these sort of diagrams and they say, oh yeah, yeah well how, how, do you, how, how do you know that? And, uh, no, it looks very pretty, but you know, how do we, how do you figure that one out? <coughs> so, those black things are earthquakes. This is, this is a slice through the ground. It's the same scale that way as that way, and it's about the location of Wellington. And all these things are earthquakes that have been measured. <coughs> um, and, and when an earthquake happens. As long as you've got three seismographs somewhere, you can, by triangulation, 
work out where it was by, the, by, by when the earthquake arrived at each instrument. So <clears throat> what has been initially puzzling to scientists when they first developed seismographs and started to measure these things was why, is these, why, why are these zone, zones of deep earthquakes descending down under the, continent, under the margins of the continents around big ocean basins? Um, for a long time, this was called a Benioff zone after Professor Benioff, who made a big song and dance about it, but didn't know what it was. Um, but now we uh, happily interpret that as being earthquakes in the continental crust down to about 30 meter, 30 kilometers depth, and then earthquakes in the ocean floor crust, which has been pushed down under the continent. Mm. And, so it, and, and so this is not exaggerated. The ocean crust that actually goes near vertical under un underneath the western North Island at uh, depths of about 300 kilometres. So that's yeah. So that's um, that's the big picture of tectonics in New Zealand in, in, in regard to movement of plates. Um, so we're now going to have a look. We're going we're to zoom back in and, and start to just finish off by looking at the context of the Oslo Fault. So this is what we call a subduction zone, the blues going under the pink. This is what we would call a, um, a, a transform fault zone to the continent, that's your alpine fault, and then we have subduction going on down there in the fjord. And we're going to go to the middle of that. So this is um, another one of these block diagrams, so like a cube cut. In, into the crust and then tilt it up. Alpine fault through here with rocks of the Australian plate on that side. Jagged red line, it's got a few, it's got a bit of complexity of the Alpine fault through here. That's the sea, that's, a, that, that's the west coastal coastal plain here and that's the uh, Tasman Sea. Main divide of the Southern Alps is about there. Mountainous and then we go out to the Canterbury Plains out towards that direction. Alpine fault is interpreted as um, going down at a, I don't know, probably a, a moderate angle, not, not too steep and not too gentle, about like that. Um, and as it gets down to depth, it's thought to sort of flatten out where the rocks become more ductile. And um, it's thought that all of these red and orange lines through here, which, which, are, which are the faults that have broken out to the surface, uh, linked in to the Alpine Fault of depth. The Alpine Fault is sort of diving underneath us and these faults are breaking back out the other way. Um, sort of <coughs> partly accommodate all the compression that's going on. So that's, um, in this diagram here, there's your Oslo Fault. Coming in, uh, thought to be coming off the Alpine Fault which almost flattened out at depth, breaking through here and uh, running up alongside Lake Pukaki. There's just a bit more detail of the whole, uh, the whole picture as we imagine it from the mapping of the rocks at the surface and interpreting them. So that's, um, that's all good stuff. Um, now the Oster Fault, some, some investigations have been done, but it's, it's actually quite an under-investigated fault. It's not had a lot of work done on it, partly because we can make some really good interpretations from all these fossil ice age landforms whose ages we now know, so we can start to work out um, you know, 20 metres of offset in 22,000 years, we can start to work out what a rate of movement that is. Um, we have, um, <coughs> so the information that we have tells us three, so we, we, we have one piece of information that says there appears to have been three Earthquakes, and when I say earthquakes, that's, I mean, uh, what we see here is, is we actually see the fault having ruptured the ground. And of course, that will have caused the earthquake. We don't actually measure the earthquakes because they happened long in the past, but we can recognise their occurrence by the ground having been offset by the fault movement. Um, so we, we, we're pretty confident it's had three movements in the last 10,000 years or so. Um, that's about an average of 3,300 years per, <coughs> per earthquake. Um, 
we, we, we know at, at, at Lake Ruatanifa that the 18,000 year old uh, fossil, fossil river plain and the 22,500 year fossil river plain both have the same offset on them. The fault didn't move at all in that time period of almost four and a half thousand years. So that's, that's, that's a, a good piece of information. Now, does it move regularly? We don't, we don't really know. We don't know how much it moves at a time. Um, I think it's, I would say that probably my overall best guess would be that it moves <coughs> Every, on, on average every three and a half, four thousand years, um, probably breaks through the ground and you get an offset of three or four metres each time. <coughs> and that's going to be a magnitude seven or seven and a bit <coughs> earthquake when you consider how long the fault is and um, that amount of movement. It gives you a big earthquake each time. <coughs> now what that does is it makes quite a big step in the ground and, and certainly makes a mess of anything you build across it. This is uh, 2016 Takura earthquake. Uh, this is the Papatea Fault, which is um, towards the uh, north of Takura. Um, it's about a four, five metre high offset. This is, this is Highway 1. Um, and it's also gone a bit sideways, so it's gone up that side and also gone that way a bit, and that's why the, 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 all the lines are crashing across there. But that would, 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 would be of the scale of what I'd expect to see an Oslo fault scarp look like um, if it was there. When you drive that road, there's hardly any passing lanes between Christchurch and Picton, or so it seems, but the two places where the, earth, where the Kaikoura earthquake broke faults across the highway we're both on passing lanes. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Sounds like a conspiracy theory. <laughs> um, and, and this is an example of a house. This, this is the Kikarinu fault. Um, a bit different to the Oslo fault because it's a sideways moving fault. But um, it so happened that this uh, uh, farm, farm cottage was built smack bang across it and it was torn in two. That's the foundation there and that's the, the house there. Um, and it, uh, it it performed really well under the circumstances of having eight metres of sideways offset go through it like that. Um, the guy who was sleeping in the house has now stopped running, I think. <laughs> so the rumour is he 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 was he was unscathed, although uh, quite unhappy. <coughs> um, yeah, so that's that's uh, that's the Oster Fold. It's it's a spectacular landform. It's um, it's in a very special landscape, and it's beautifully, it's beautifully preserved as as they come. And the fact that it's in a, a, a landscape such as this, we can understand and learn a lot from it. So, just to <coughs> highlight that, you know, up in this part of the world, you've got you know some really outstanding landform features, uh, particularly these huge areas of fossil. Ice Age landforms, these fossil river plains and all these moraines which are um, you know, pristine even in that space of time. Um, the glacier records really, you know, it, 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 there's a fantastic record of glacier fluctuations here which I didn't go into <coughs> but, but being able to date the glacier behaviour helps in forms of that climate um, and, and you know this really is, this really is textbook sort of quality as, as, as in as good an illustration as you'll ever find. Um, I didn't mention quite wisely that the we think the Oslo Fault last moved about three and a half thousand years ago <laughs> and it goes on average about three and a half thousand years so um, what I say to people is that don't panic, you know, don't, 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 don't be alarmed but don't be complacent and so be prepared for dealing with it, if it did break through and, and, and give us some, an earthquake locally here of the, of the scale of the uh, Darfield earthquake of 2010 or some components of the Kaikoura earthquake and um, you know this is, this is real natural heritage that um, it's as good as it gets and we should do our best to preserve it as well as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David.
uh, you predict that the um, Oslo fault is not far away. In terms, you said uh, a quake of measuring seven. With your analysis and with your colleagues of, of, of reading those um, earthquake projections, what is your prediction when it comes? <coughs> the next 50 years, is it? Oh, uh, it, it's uh, <coughs> when we sort of reel off something like goes, you know, on average once every three and a half thousand years, three and a half thousand years ago, we neglect to mention that there's probably, there could be plus or minus many hundreds of years on that. Mm. Um, so, um, and, and we don't know, I mean, the thing is, the, does it go, you know, does it go off regularly or does it have, you know, some short ones and then go quiet and then have another one? This is, this is part of what we're trying to understand a bit more about whether you know, what's the typical behaviour of faults are they are they, are they regular? <coughs> the Alpine fault is um, because it forms the plate boundary. It's our most active fault. It moves on average uh, once every three hundred years. So there'll be ten Alpine fault earthquakes for every Oslo fault. So, so what we set that off volcanoes, tidal waves. It's just it's just it's it's it's, it's, the, <coughs> it's like a stretch rubber band. And you stretch it and stretch it and stretch it and one day it breaks. So it, it, it's, it's the forces of the Earth's plates moving and pushing together. And um, the real kicker is that um, in the last 20 years um, we've had continuous um, survey monitoring with GPS. It is a continuous GPS mounted on a proper survey mountain just measuring away and away. And it turns out that Along, you know, according with the predictions made from looking at the the, the plates globally, um, Christchurch is going that way, and Hokitik is going that way. A few centimeters every year. <coughs> so, so, so basically, between Christchurch and Hokitika, the movement's happening. The rock must be bending, and it must be taking the strain because we know the the, the, the fault hasn't moved, and one day that's just going to go bang. And Things are going to even up again, so that's that's the that's the process by by which it happened. So the, the Alpine Fault, <coughs> on average, three hundred years plus or minus one hundred. So <coughs> there's a fantastic record being done by some of my colleagues uh, going back eight thousand. We've got eight thousand years of Alpine Fault movements mm -hmm. um, from measuring uh, offset swamp deposits in, 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 in a special place where the sediments have built up each time there's a fault movement. They've got 8,000 8, years of record, about 28 earthquakes. Sometimes it can be 450 years between earthquakes, other times it's 250. So sometimes, so even that fault has a bit of variation, but um, what we know about that is that 300 years plus or minus 100 is about, about the average, and it's 300 and five years since it last moved. So <coughs> that's the one to, um, out, out here, I mean, you know, we're 80 kilometres away from where that epicentre will be, and so it won't be as intense as it will be for some. Probably not going to make the mountains fall down or, or, or anything too dramatic, but um, it's going to be a good long shake. So if, if you do happen to wake up and, and Remember, there's a 33% chance it's going to happen when you're asleep, if you, if, if, if you manage eight hours of sleep a day. Um, and, and so, that um, when it happens, you'll sort of feel that there'll be a big swaying thing. And if it stops after about half a minute, it's probably your Ostler fault. But if it's still going after two minutes, then that's almost certainly your Alpine fault. So, so that'll be, um, the Kaikoura earthquake went on for about um, <coughs> two minutes and it was magnitude 7.8, so mm. about four times smaller than an Alpine fault earthquake would be. So, so if you find the earthquake going on for a hell of a long time, then yeah. Alpine fault's probably... So the, <coughs> the, what are the chances of other fault lines um, appearing with a major Alpine, after a major Alpine? Um, probably the answer I'd always give is that um, 
because the alpine fault moves so frequently, and we have an ostler fault which moves, you know, only one tenth as often, um, we can be pretty sure that the alpine fault doesn't usually trigger the ostler fault, and, and, and so um, because there are there are no other faults anywhere, you know, the, the most active fault after the alpine fault is several times less active. So I think in general, they're not going to depend on each other in any particular way. I mean, um, <coughs> there'll be a degree of randomness, you know, that the, the, the ones that move infrequently, you know, they don't move very often, and the, and the Osler fault at three and a half thousand years is, is quite, you know, qu quite regular. There are many more which probably don't even move once every 10,000 years, but there are so many of them, when you start to add them up across the whole of the east and south island, you sort of rapidly run out of fingers and then you run out of toes and you, you end up with about a hundred other things, all of which don't move very often. Because there's a hundred of them, there's a chance you're going to get one happen in any particular window of time. The um, Greendale Fault that caused the 2010 Darfield earthquake its previous most recent movement was 25,000 years ago, you know, distant past. Um, and, and so it just so happened that, um, you know, Christchurch was built unwittingly very close by a fault we didn't know about and a fault that on all, you know, for all intents and purposes just is highly inactive and so, but it happened. <coughs> so that's the, I think the, the take home that I always say to people is that the best thing, you know, there's nothing worrying about them, but be prepared for dealing with it. Um, and, and so <coughs> there's a one third chance it'll happen when you're asleep, um, any earthquake nearby. I mean, it's, 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 it's quite a big chance. And so um, keep your sleeping area safe. Don't have a great big wardrobe full of, you know, huge pots and ornaments unsecured hanging over your bed, for example. Um, you know, know where your shoes are, know where your torch is, um, because the thing which we've found in, in the earthquakes of the past 12 years is that, um, you know, a, a lot of um, adverse effect on people is because, you know, they've leapt out of bed and tried to drop cover and hold and cut themselves on the broken glass from the window, and, you know, then you've got to try and find a first aid kit to stop the stop the cut foot and so forth. So just simple things like secure a sleeping area, know where there are shoes, you know, everyone's got a torch these days with the mobile phone, but um, you know, those, those simple things are just ways that we can um, make our lives a bit more secure and let us respond more, more readily to what needs to be done. I've got a quick question, and it's a little bit simpler and possibly a bit more obvious, but some areas of the Osler Fault have only moved 20 metres or so, and yet the Table Hill okay, is yep. 200 metres. Yep. I'm curious about why the difference at that point and... So, difference in age. Oh, okay. Table Hill's been around for 200,000 oh, years. A, it was already a lump in... Oh, but no, well, so, so, so it, it began just the same as yeah. the other ones. Yeah. 200,000 years ago, it was, it was just a river plain. Then the fault moved and jacked it up and jacked it up and jacked it up and jacked it up and kept jacking it up and then another ice age cycle rolled in to Lake Ohau and, and, and Pukaki and, and the glacier oh, so rebuilt it up. and then it and then it's made new outwash plains through there which are much younger. And, and so uh, they've only had twenty thousand years to collect movement, which amounts to <coughs> yeah. um, twenty metres, whereas Table Hill has sort of been started off growing and has kept growing for 200,000, so that's why it's high, higher. Mm -hmm. um, at the point that the uh, Oslo Fault crosses the Ahariri River near Clay Close, um, you, you showed your photograph where it displaced the road and, and, and so on, um, it appears that the current Ahariri River may have got pushed to the north and account, possibly account for the big swing of the Ahariri River to the north. A question for those of us that live in Amarama, and we think about it quite a lot, especially in these rainy periods, 
is the Ahuriri River likely to swing back towards Marama? Or is the dam effect of the, uh, of the Oslo Fault crossing there sufficient to keep it over there, at least for our lifetimes? Um, <coughs> it's, it's, it's really hard to tell sometimes in a, in a landscape. I mean, a, a river is its own agent. I mean, you know, people think it's a powerful river, but actually all it's doing is flowing, flowing as gently to the sea as it can. Um, it's just the, around here, it's, it's got quite a steep path, and, and, and so it, it does have some power to it. Um, it, it. It could as easily have gone around the other side of the fault where, it's, where, it's, where the fault's done that turn, but it's, it, it's sort of, it just so happened, I think, that it was in the current, roughly its current path when the Ice Age ended and, and, and the fault scarp, fault scarp started to to offset those fossil planes. So, so I think it's, um, I'd say it's probably just a matter of luck of the draw that it was flowing somewhere over in its current path at about the time when it, it sort of got locked into that path. And it's partly because um, during an ice age maximum where, where the glaciers are fully expanded and, and they're pushing all of their gravel that's been washed out of the snout of the glacier and flowing on down uh, downstream, that's a time when sediment uh, you know, is, is abundant, being, being sent down the river. And when the glacier falls back, it makes a hole of some sort that traps all the sediment. And so um, suddenly that river, which had lots of sediment, has suddenly um, got plenty of water but no sediment, and that's why it cuts its bed down usually. And so that, that's why the Kaki River has cut a huge canyon um, just because of that lake there stopping the sediment and, and the same thing is um, happening as we speak with uh, Tasman Lake up at the, up, 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 up at the Iraqi Mount Cook where when, the, when that lake formed that river channel just cut down like that and, and, and locked itself into that position and it's not going to readily change. Um, could it break out this way? I mean I, I think it's um, at least here we're on a terrace that's six, seven metres above river level. So actually up on here we're on a terrace which is um, not going to be overwhelmed um, under any any foreseeable conditions in the, in, in the modern climate and so it will probably take another ice age to sort of change that situation. So up, up here we're fine. When you're sort of down at camping ground level you're a bit, uh, the freeboard's pretty limited. And, and so um, it's, it's, that's quite vulnerable to a Marama stream and, and the Ahuriri coming together there. But I think um, more than likely that's, that's how it's going to play out for <coughs> a very long foreseeable time. Like the, the status quo is going to remain? I, I, for, yeah, yeah, I would say, yeah. yeah, yeah well, thank you for that. Don't, don't, much don't, don't panic, don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it's, it's, so, so no problem if the fault doesn't move, but um, when it does, and I'll say when it does move, but who, who knows when that's going to be, but it is going to move sometime into the future. It will break across the canal, um, just, to the, uh, just to the north of the Twizel River. Um, and in, in fact, the, the design strategy, well, I'm not aware of what, you know, <coughs> what are we going to do with that? So, so there, there, there's no real mitigation in the canal design for that. Um, if that happens, it's a, the whole design is put it in a place where if it, if it breaks, the flow's gonna go down the Twizel River channel. Um, and of course, they'll instantly cut off the flow at um, the uh, Pukeki outlet. So, so it'll only be a, a canal full of water that has to be drained out. Um, so it's not it's not like all of Lake Bukaki is something going to drain, <laughs> drain through Twizel. So, so those are parts of the, um, those are the measures there. So they accept that the, the possibility is that the canal will fail if the fault moves, and they'll just deal with that. Um, for New Zealand, the implication is that suddenly we'll have three power stations, which are fed just from uh, Lake Ohau rather than from Lake Bukaki as well. So Ohau. 
um, uh, A, B and C will then only have water from the Ohau system going through them and so there'll be, um, could be a bit of a bit of a power crisis but um, otherwise Benmore and Aviemore and Waitaki will be doing their thing same as they ever were. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much David. Um, I've learned a lot from the small picture mm. to the bigger picture of where it all fits in within New Zealand and especially spotting the fault because I knew it was there and some landscapes I thought might be connected to it so now I'm actually looking forward to driving around next time and spotting it all around. So thank you on behalf of the Geo Park and I'm sure of everyone here. And um, we've got a little goodie bag. Oh, thank you very much. Goodies <laughs> as a thank you. And just as we were talking about preparedness with earthquakes, I thought I'd just mention that as a geopark, we are also involved in organising um, a talk in Omaru um, by a group that's called AFH. So they are um, going around the country and preparing communities on what to do when the Alpine fault ruptures. Um, so that's going to happen. I'm pretty sure it's in the first week of October, but I will make sure it's also in the Gazette, so if people are interested um, to come to that one as well. Okay, Thank I you. think we're at the end. As you would have seen, there's some information about the geopark if you're interested to learn a bit more. Other than that, thank you so much for coming out tonight and have a safe drive.